So hi, hi Julie. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I know. Birthday. What's that? This is the day of your birthday. April 26th. Happy almost. Thank you. Yeah, this was like one of my gifts to myself was wanting to talk with you and a few other special people in my life. So thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. Yeah. Julie, Julie Levitt is, um, well, gosh, I don't even know how to introduce you because you're many, many things. So I'll let you introduce yourself, but I'll just say, I know, I know Julie, um, from some classes I took at Leslie university, particular, um, Jungian dance and drama therapy. Took that a couple times with you. And who's the other one called movement healing movement and healing. Yeah. And I just love your way with authentic movement and Jungian stuff. And, um, and then you were there at the birth of my first child. <laughs> a special, forever special privilege moment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was curious to ask you, what is your understanding and or experience of muse of the muse yeah. as the dog barks <laughs> he's not really my muse <laughs> what do i think of muse i think of what inspires me what inspires us what um kind of reminds us who we are and pulls something new forward and keeps it moving forward so traditionally it's uh you know i thought of as a person and thought of as a woman because men have spoken a lot about their muses i find that a muse is anything that really calls forth um who we are who i am something that that makes the juices flow so that creativity uh comes not easier but it becomes such a driving necessity so mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. uh, a student of mine I'm, I'm in the midst of reading student papers right now and she's talking about the muse and she's talking about music she she named her muse the musician mm -hmm. and i love that i love that you know that that the muse can come into music can come into kind of how how we're how we're carried on um, on some kind of a note, be it a, a musical phrase, dance, art, um, creating podcasts like you do, and um, you know so many so many uh, vehicles for creativity. So yeah, maybe that's what it is, kind of a, a the vehicle for the for the creative um, to come to come out of us. From us. Yeah. Hmm. Nice. And um, I was thinking about in your Jungian class, one of the things that you do in the beginning is look at and experience this idea of prima materia. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I really learned about that through um, a teacher and therapist of mine, Noor Hall, who's a Jungian in St. Paul, Minnesota and an amazing woman and and she taught me about that that place prima materia comes from alchemy it comes from um really a, a word for lead that lifts lead into the symbolic hmm. so lead is the prima materia it's the first um image right it's the it's we have to have a place to begin so that transformation or you know, they call them operations in alchemy, all the different transformative operations from substance to substance toward gold or toward the um, conjunctio, the meeting of the, um, uh, toward making love, right? Toward, towards coming to love uh, can happen. So it starts with a very kind of denseness that is often where the prima materia is and has to be the necessity of that in order for there to be 
um, transformation. Can you say what, what is alchemy? Yeah, alchemy originally was a medieval science of turning lead into gold. And the alchemists were absolutely driven by this and went into their laboratories and did all kinds of operations and went from, you go from the Negredo to the Albedo to the Rubedo. And it goes through all these um, different uh, processes that also reflect our own natures. So for example, there's, uh, when we're in the negredo, everything is dark. Negredo is another, you know, word for blackness. Everything is, is dark. We can't see. We can't see anything in front of us. Everything feels bleak. You know, lead is a form of depression. And um, so, and then the negredo starts to move because it's very important somehow to go into the darkness to go into the place where we just can't see as much as we want to. Uh, we just, it's dark. And, um, you know, the dark night of the soul is one very poetic way of naming it. It doesn't feel very poetic when we're in it. Uh, and then the, um, I'm not even sure exactly what the process is, but there's, um, I think, well, I'll say it this way and don't, completely quote me on it but it can go into the albedo which is the white and then everything is whitewashed it's kind of like i'm so happy to be out of the dark that i'm done i you know boom boom process done i'm happy and um and that's kind of the whitewash it's kind of the relief of feeling some kind of lightness so that we feel like that's enough i don't want to look at anything else and then the rubedo is you know, a form of anger. It's the fire that has to, to really move through uh, in order to create gold, in order to create the, um, the real, uh, you know, to come into the, you know, it's a birthing process, but to come into the real light. You know, it's not just the light of, of the albedo, which is the coming through the darkness. It's the light that's the divine light. Mm -hmm. And that's really what gold symbolizes. It, it symbolizes the light of the divine, which is something that no human being can create. And the only way we can reach it is through going through all of these inner um, transformations. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And you bring that into your your teaching and your work with people and groups and individually through authentic movement and creative process or can you say some ways that you like bring that into an experiential setting mm. well i think one thing is to have the awareness of it for me as a therapist as a teacher to have the awareness of that it might feel good to stop here and we're not finished. And it, and it feels so good to have some lightness and let's savor it. But there's more. And that, um, you know, I might speak of it really directly, um, you know, describe alchemy, or I might just be informed by it and, and help whatever clients or students that are going through this process to have an awareness of being in the process and where the process can go so that there can be some kind of vision there, especially in the darkness, how important and how hard, mm. how hard it is. So for me in my life, I really learned about alchemy when I was in the blackness. Mm. And I remember Nora Hall was one of the teachers and I said to her, you know, why am I learning about alchemy right now? What what is this all about? Mm. And she said, at some point in your life, it's going to be important. Mm. And um, I so, I just trusted her on that. And it's interesting how things have evolved. Mm. Uh, the prima materia is important. And for me, I'm also a spiritual director. I work um, at a rabbinical school and privately as a spiritual director. And there's something about what Jung taught about spirituality as being the really true healing that also came out of my 
I'm, I'm sure came out of my understanding of the alchemical process as well as my own journey. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whatever, I feel like whatever we've been through, whatever I've been through, it comes out in the work. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you are working with that very beautifully. Yeah, I was just having memories of being in your class and I can't, I'm like trying to remember whether it was my the birth of my first child or my second child or both. No, it was the first, it was my first child is like this going in the direction of the desire to be a mom and then being pregnant and then just like mm. moving with all of the feelings and all the process that was going on in that transition just Mm. week after week it was such a beautiful space Mm. of like living into the the nuances of what that transition was for me and well alchemy is you know really (laughs) birth is such as the creative process itself so (laughs) yeah it's a great symbol to look at alchemy too yeah yeah you know If if you have the opportunity to really labor all the way through, yeah, which, yeah, you were there, <laughs> baby, hand on my on my back, beautifully, amazingly, yeah. difficultly, um, with beautiful mm-hmm. fruit. Yeah, so beautiful, beautiful fruit <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, can you say a little bit about the relationship? between creativity and authentic movement and or Jungian work, just like how creativity folds in or out or through these practices. Well, it's your movements just now really <laughs> reminds me of it. I, the I, word I, that has come to me the past many years is unwinding. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I really learned this from authentic movement because in my experience of it, I start somewhere, uh, maybe we can call it the prima materia, it's that, that beginning seed or locus. And then from there, uh, there's an unwinding. And I, I believe that the unwinding kind of starts where I stopped somewhere. Mm. It, there's a place inside that, that needs to continue, mm. it needs to be. Um, it needs to emerge. Mm. But I like that word unwind because it has a little snakiness to it and it has the you know, nonlinear place so that uh, I have no idea where it's going and authentic movement and creative process in general just seems to go along and particularly authentic movement has just taught me to uh, rely on that um, thread that thread of, of, of sensation or image or intuition, uh, emotion, that is the creative process, that is the, um, the healing process. And, you know, again, I feel like these are all, they're all one and the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if I answered that. Yeah, no, you did. And it makes me think too of, when you mentioned the healing process and I'm thinking about the spectrum of where one could be at or where we are all at on different stages of our, of our healing journey. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about how you work with people differently, depending on where they're at in their, in their journey. Mm. Do you mean in a group or individually? Yeah, in a group or individually? Yeah. Mm. Well, my teacher, Norma Kanner, uh, taught me to start where they are, you know, so there's something about uh, kinesthetic listening that helps that. And I can feel my own drawing back if I'm, if I'm wanting to be somewhere else or wanting someone to be somewhere else, mm-hmm. uh, because the, to, to resonate, to have kinesthetic empathy means to really listen for where someone is mm-hmm. and uh, you know whether it's an authentic movement group or a or a class or an individual session it's a it's a variety of listening mm-hmm. and um, 
I learned in spiritual direction the term deep listening, and that really reflected my experience uh, as a witness in authentic movement, uh, and and as a very kinesthetic witness. Mm. Like can, you say, can you say a little bit more about the witness role in authentic movement for people who are new? Mm-hmm. To the idea? So authentic movement is. Um, the ground form of authentic movement is originally a relationship between a mover and a witness. And the mover's eyes are closed and the witness's eyes are open. And the, there's a little bit of, of um, the witness inside of the mover because she, she listens and begins to track her movement and to develop um, the compassionate, compassion for herself. And the witness is also trained in the practice of compassion to see the mover not as someone to analyze or fix or um, be a therapist of, but more as a, as a living process, as a living um, uh, creative process to, to track and to breathe with and to be able to witness this the unknown unwinding through the movement of another Mm -hmm. or the stillness. And witness uses a lot of sensation and intuition and develops an emotional intelligence for um, being in this place of of, of the unknown uh, as it is unfolding in the presence of another person. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I mean, I find the unknown really, really hard to deal with. So I think I had to find this practice so I could mm-hmm. have an anchor mm-hmm. or, or a theology of, of, of the unknown. Mm-hmm. And the witness really um, contains some, works on containing enough presence and compassion to sit with a person as they are in their most innocent and raw. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a great honor. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can you say a little about, um, about active imagination? Mm. I mean, all these words are so delicious and all are about the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> in the Jungian class right now, we're in our last three classes. Oh, nice. And um, active imagination is really um, about focusing on the interaction with an image. So I love that I, it took me, you know, a few decades to discover that the word image is in imagination. And once I understood that, I understood that, um, that an image comes out of imagination. Right. So, th- and that it's not just, oh, she's really imaginative or wow, she's got some imagination, but it's, it's the, it's the living creative process. It's a sense of that our imagination engages with an image that is alive and that is in ourselves and not totally of ourselves. Uh, James Hillman, you, may, you might remember James, James Hillman talked about, um, that the, one of the most important things about interacting with image is to understand that the image has a life of its own. So imagination is like a bridge for us to go between our own souls, our own selves, and an image that visits us. And so active imagination is the conscious uh, activation of our imaginations mm. and in creating relationship with an image. Mm. Beautiful. And what do you do when someone has a hard time imagining an image and you're playing in this way? Yeah, I, I, I try to find how they, how they know, like what's their way of knowing is their way of knowing uh, through sensation. Is it through the, you know, mind which often is image, is it through emotion? You know, what's, what's blocking that? And if, if there's 
if I can get to the place where there's a block, maybe a belief system, I'm not sure what it might be, then we can have active imag imagination with the block. So I have a client now who uh, really was blocked for a very long time. So we worked, we worked on sensation because he just didn't have a relationship with his body. He couldn't feel his body. He didn't feel like it was real. And so we worked step by step with, you know, he started to feel the breath uh, coming out of his nostrils. He started to hear the sound of the clock in the room. He, he felt his toes inside of his shoes. And so all of those are images. They're all like living um, awarenesses. And those were based in sensation because that was the portal that really took him into his imagination. And it's just incredible where he's gone with it. It's really interesting. So it's often the block or the resistance that wants attention. So it's finding the way of knowing and what is it that is really seeking attention. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. So mm -hmm. you, yep. I know I didn't really introduce you properly in the beginning in terms of the different things that you do. Would you just lay those out? So if anyone wants to sure. come find you. The, the prima materia is dance <laughs> <laughs> in the body. Mm -hmm. So I feel like all, everything that I do comes through dance in the body. Mm -hmm. And I work as a dance movement therapist and I have a private practice and uh, as a body centered psychotherapist. And I also teach at Leslie University. I teach uh, in the expressive therapies graduate school. Uh, I teach dance therapy courses and uh, I'm a spiritual director, spiritual director at Hebrew college. And then privately in my private practice, I teach authentic movement and I do choreography and dance. I'm a student and a, you know, I teach, but I, I don't really teach dance classes. I teach dance therapy classes, but I am in all these performances right now. It's quite overwhelming and wonderful. Mm. And I'm a mom and a doula and I marry people and I, I'm there when people die or do their funerals and I lead services. I do like way too many things, <laughs> it's all connected. Yeah. That's why we don't see each other, <laughs> really. It's like a lot to drive across town. Yeah. I apologize. No, I, you know, it's <laughs> wonderful to connect whenever. Yeah, I really do. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel very blessed to be able to, um, to, to do the work that I do. Yeah. Mm. And the people whose lives you connect with our blessed also mm, yeah it's pretty mutual yeah so sweet one of the things that i rem i was preparing for our talk and just sort of looking over some of my stuff in my computer and i have all these files of assignments that i did and then there were these letters that mm. was an assignment to write you letters each week mm. and your responses and that was such a nourishing mm. assignment i love that it's really wonderful because I, yeah. you know, you assign people journal entries and it's, you know, how do you really write a journal entry knowing somebody's going to read it? So I, I thought, oh, a letter, a letter is a way of, um, of, of gaining, of, of sharing intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. So rich, such a rich mm -hmm. framework and experience. Yeah. yeah. Yay. Well, thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that time out of your day. And I thought of as an expert, it's really <laughs> it's something that say I it, say it again. It's really a, a delight being thought of as an expert for a few minutes. <laughs> I really uh, appreciate that. And I so appreciate you and, and the work that you're doing and who you are in the world, Tiffany. It's, mm. You're an inspiration. Mm. Thanks, Julie. Mm. Mm. Well, um, till we meet again. Sounds good. <laughs>